Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Tavener and I am your host of Any Further Questions. Today's episode we're asking, why is there only one species of human? All previous episodes of Any Further Questions are available to listen to on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so please do go and check them out now. My guest today is our Gresham Professor of Physic, Robin May, and he's joined me to answer a heap of questions we didn't have time to get to following his third lecture of his series on the big questions of evolution. Robin, how are you? I'm very well, thanks Richard. Thank you for joining me. Robin is our current Gresham Professor of Physic, appointed in May 2022. He spends most of his time at the University of Birmingham as their Professor of Infectious Diseases and also acts as their Chief Scientific Advisor at the Food Standards Agency. His series this year is called Evolution at the Big Questions and answers questions such as which evolutionary experiments were short-lived and why, how important was random chance in shaping the biodiversity of Earth, and the topic of today's podcast and the question Robin did, or didn't for that matter, answer, why is there only a single species of human in existence today? So Robin, can I start by asking you to define the word human? What do we mean by the word human? It's good to start with the tricky questions, Richard. Uh, so that that is not straightforward. Uh, so what we think of as being human today is essentially Homo sapiens, so our own species. Um, and at the moment, that is a very straightforward answer because there is only one species of human, as we talked about in the lecture, and that's it. Historically, much harder to draw the lines about when a human became a human. And there are lots of other species, like Neanderthals, for example, that are on this gradient towards being human. Uh, but whether we would actually call them human or not probably depends very much on whether you were a Homo sapiens or you were a Neanderthal at the time. We had lots of questions from our online audience and we had lots of questions from our in-person audience that we'll get to. But I'll start a question from me that I had after watching the lecture. You mentioned that in the 2% two, two to 3% of the unexplored areas in the globe, it's rather unlikely that we'll have another human species. Is it worth investigating scientifically and are there people putting serious research into the existence of this type of creature? Brilliant. So so I have to say, slightly disappointingly, I think the chance of there being an undiscovered second species, very like humans, out there in the world today is pretty slender. I mean, good scientists never rule anything out, but I'm pretty close to ruling that one out. However, um, there has, as you say, been for centuries interest in these uh, you know, enigmatic, do they exist, yetis or whatever. Um, I would say that the vast majority of scientific data suggests there isn't anything to see there. But one thing that strikes me actually is that we now have the tools to address that definitively, particularly in terms of environmental DNA. So this is using very, very sensitive DNA detection in, for example, rivers. Um, and it's something that's been employed very usefully to look for um, very uh, rare populations of marine mammal. For example, you can look in the water identify the DNA and say definitively, yes, this dolphin is there or this dolphin is not there. Um, so I guess, in theory, we could look in uh, regions where these uh, so-called organisms have been seen for DNA that looks kind of human but is different enough to not be human. Um, I suspect we're not going to find it, uh, but in principle, it's a, a relatively answerable scientific question now, I would say. I would imagine that the ocean is probably a better place to find new species rather than on land just because of the nature of how unexplored the ocean is in terms of species generally i think you're probably right i mean there's a large especially the deep oceans of course are very very unexplored uh, yeah. I, I think it's quite unlikely there's an aquatic human out there but no. um, for other species <laughs> quite likely so we come to our first question um from our online audience how can we tell which tools were made by humans and which ones were made by neanderthals that's a really great question. Um, and over the last sort of 30 or 40 years, we've discovered more and more um, ancient tools, in particularly in caves. Um, usually the way we attribute them is by looking at the fossil evidence that's in the same location. So if you see a bunch of stone tools and you find ancient Homo sapiens, for example, you ascribe the tool to the Homo sapiens. Um, what has happened fairly recently, actually, um, is a number of revelations where we have found what were for the period quite advanced tools 
previously attributed to Homo sapiens, and now we've re-examined fossil material with them, uh, and this is in particular uh, data coming out of what is in areas in the Middle East, Israel in particular, um, we look at this fossil material and realise that that's not Homo sapiens, it's actually, for example, Neanderthals. Uh, and that is one of the really big pieces of evidence that suggests that Neanderthals, uh, far from being these sort of ignorant cavemen, were actually capable of really quite advanced technology, um, including tools that are essentially indistinguishable from those made by early Homo sapiens. Do we know how much DNA the average human shares with Neanderthals? Average human is an interesting question. Um, so it depends on where you come from and what your uh, background is. Uh, but for uh, myself, for example, as a kind of Western European, on average, most Western Europeans have about 2% of their genome. Um, uh, that is more similar to Neanderthal genomes than other Homo sapiens. Um, if you are from uh, Africa and can trace your lineage unbroken through Africa, uh, so in other words, uh, you've been kind of endemic to that region for your whole, um, all the previous generations, uh, then you may not have any Neanderthal DNA. Um, and and different populations have more or less, but it varies depending on where you are. And that's because those early migration patterns, people met and bred with Neanderthals when they entered Europe. So if you're in a population that has never migrated out into Europe, you may not have that Neanderthal DNA. Given Homo sapiens has bred with other Homo species, at what point, and this person says the example percentage of DNA, do we stop being sapiens? When is a species really a species? Uh, and that's a very tricky question, not just for humans, for lots of species. Um, broadly speaking, the definition that's most widely used is about this idea of interbreeding and being reproductively uh, separate from other organisms. So even if you can interbreed, if in practice you rarely do that, or actually the progeny of those breeding events are less fit then you are still probably a species. Um, in the case of Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens, we of course don't know how successful those hybrids, for want of a better word, were, um, because we don't have Neanderthals around anymore. Um, there is some genetic evidence that, uh, for example, in terms of inheritance, we haven't inherited all parts of the Neanderthal genome equally, suggesting perhaps that um, there was some disadvantage to being a hybrid, that those hybrids died out, which is kind of a suggestion that there was a species barrier. Um, but it's a good point about whether those were truly distinct, or for example, are they more similar to subspecies or varieties that we might talk about for you know, cattle or dogs, for instance? How much difference is needed to classify two individuals into different species? That depends a lot on what species you're talking about. So for um, a primate like ourselves, for example, uh, so if you, if you think about it, so humans on average differ by uh, you know far less than 1% of their genome between any two. Uh, we differ by about 2% from chimpanzees, our nearest relatives. Um, so, so that's quite a clear divide. If, on the other hand, you're talking about something like bacteria, uh, bacteria can swap huge chunks of their, of their genome with each other all the time, and do do that all the time. Um, so that kind of percentage DNA difference is less useful there, and the question becomes how commonly those chunks are exchanged and are they truly species so it varies a lot um, but for uh, for organisms like ourselves I think broadly speaking you're looking at relatively low sub one percent variation within a species. Would it be possible for homo sapiens to evolve into a different species now? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the key points is that evolution never stops. Uh, we may think that we are somehow very superior and have stepped off the ladder. But of course, like all other organisms, we reproduce either successfully or unsuccessfully. So evolution is having a process. Um, and one could imagine, uh, so you know, thankfully it didn't happen, one can imagine a, a very serious pandemic like the COVID-19 pandemic we've just had had we not had any uh, substantial medical intervention and actually survival was all about your genes, that would have been an enormous selective pressure um, and might have led to quite a big shift in the, in the human population. Um, the question of whether we become a different species essentially depends on how much change happens. And these, these big changes that put species barriers between organisms don't happen overnight, so it would take a long time. But there's absolutely no reason why you know, millions of years in the future, there may not be two or three or 10 species that all descended from Homo sapiens and are now distinct. What kind of drivers would have to happen for that to be put into place? The big driver for speciation is is that separation and remaining separate. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, you might imagine, I don't know, a hypothetical example where um, humans, you know, if you read a lot of science fiction, you often read about these kind of two, two castes or something. You have, you know, kind of some one type of humans that they breed with each other and they rule the world. And there's another type of human that's some kind of slave and they all breed with each other and don't 
interact at all. You maintain that separation long enough, you could end up with a speciation event. Um, that's seen, for example, in things like uh, fishes, where you might have some fish that descend from a common ancestor, but have adapted to different positions in the water column or different food sources, and therefore remain isolated. And over time, evolve species barriers that stop them then hybridizing and, and refusing together. I have to say I think it's quite unlikely for Homo sapiens. If you think about the way we live today, we all fly all over the world, we meet and mate with people from very, very different groups. So actually the idea that you would become so isolated you would only reproduce with your own group and somewhere else in the world there would be another group only reproducing with its own group for tens of thousands of years seems a little unlikely, but it's at least theoretically possible. So I was thinking possibly an extreme weather event fueled by climate change in thousands of years time maybe longer than that if that were to isolate communities for long enough with no technology could that be something that could possibly you know breed into something else yeah absolutely and if you think actually about the history of homo sapiens so you know uh, uh, anatomically modern humans evolved in africa we migrated out of africa to europe and asia and onwards um and since that migration, we diversified into all of the fantastic, you know, shapes and colours and differences that we see in, in modern humans around the world. Essentially, because those communities were isolated, if you were, you know, 10,000 years ago in North America or Southern Africa, you were very unlikely to meet each other and, and interbreed. Um, modern human life has completely reversed that because now we all travel all around the world. Um, and so we're, we're kind of re-blending, if you like. Uh, but in a hypothetical future where it was impossible to travel, for instance, from the Americas um, to Europe for thousands and thousands of years, yes, eventually you would you may well diverge into different species we had a question very simply saying are we still evolving today uh, and very simply the answer is yes absolutely uh, different pressures all the time um, and actually you know stay tuned in a future lecture i'm aiming to talk about uh, some of the kind of evolutionary changes that might happen in the future so um tune back in then and find out what i think at least i think you mentioned it in the lecture itself um but we had a question maybe you can go a bit further into it how did the early species of human migrate to other parts of the world so possibly emphasizing the how did they do that yeah we obviously don't know we can't wind back the clock and work out how these early humans migrated um i think one important thing to note is that over the last you know hundred thousand years for example uh the climate has changed quite dramatically and with its sea level so a lot of the places that we think of today as being either connected or disconnected by bodies of water were the opposite at some point in the past um so if you look at for example migration in uh, between islands it's possible that those were not always islands and therefore people could have simply have walked there are questions in particular about the transition in um, Asia, so to, for example, Polynesia, Australia, those kind of countries, um, because we know that they were essentially separated by water from the main body of Asia for all of human history. Uh, so for humans who have arrived there, they must have somehow travelled over water. Uh, and there's a very active debate about whether that was purposeful. Did they make boats or rafts or whatever? Or was it completely accidental and, you know, there was some tropical storm and everyone clung onto the nearest uh, tree and a few people got lucky and made it ashore? Uh, I guess we'll never know, um, but it's interesting to speculate either way. We're seen because of our intelligence as the more dominant species if you compare us to chimpanzees, bonobos, apes, our closest relatives. Might humans branch away from each other and or could other primates become more diverse and powerful than humans? That's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I think I would broaden that out and say it wouldn't necessarily have to be a primate, I think. Um, uh, so, yes, I mean, at the moment we are the dominant species in terms of technology, in terms of culture. Um, there's no sort of rule in evolution why that was the case. I mean, it just ha so happened we had the 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 phenotypes so the talents if you like to make the most of the world and spread at that moment um, you could definitely argue that long term it might not be a great strategy on the trajectory we're on at the minute you know um, the long term survival of humans doesn't look great uh, but I think it's an important point that actually uh, depending on circumstances so for instance uh, you know massive runaway climate change and a world that is massively more ocean than it is now with very little land surface it's hard to see humans being the dominant life form then, but you could, might easily imagine some kind of cetacean taking over that top spot. But uh, we'll, well, I guess I was going to say, let's find out. I guess we won't find out because we won't be here, but you know. <laughs> so that leads to my next question. What next for Homo sapiens, in your opinion? That probably depends a bit on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. <laughs> so, so I like to think if we're 
optimistic, you know, we will be able to harness the best of the technology we have um, to make a long term sustainable future. Um, so, for instance, uh, you know, we know a huge amount about genetics, we may be able to use that in a very positive way. Uh, and I use the word evolution kind of cautiously here, but to evolve it in a positive direction. So for example, um, eliminating many of the genetic disorders that are a significant problem to uh, societies today. Negatively, you could say, well, if we don't learn our lessons and there's runaway climate change and, I don't know, maybe we unleash an AI that is sort of nefarious and destroys civilization, um, you may well have to evolve in a very different circumstance. You know, the, the, the skills you need to survive some kind of apocalyptic pandemic followed by global war are a different set of skills than you might need to survive in, in a much more peaceful environment. And so I think that, that, that trajectory for evolution depends very much on what happens next. Was there a common reason as to why each other homo species died out? Was it due to health? Was it due to... Do we know? Really? We don't really know why okay. they died out. I mean, what we do know is that as anatomically modern humans moved out of Africa into Europe and then Asia, the endemic species that were there, so Neanderthals, Denisovans, um, uh, the Flores humans in, in the island of Flores in Indonesia, all died out at a similar time. Uh, at, that is not necessarily to say that modern Homo sapiens made them extinct, but it is a bit sort of smoking gun esque. Um, one suggestion is that it's a sort of combination of factors. So, for instance, we may well have brought with us diseases that were uh, for which we had resistance, but those populations did not. Um, there are, might be something about superior technology use or different cultures competition for food um, or indeed changing climate you know in a climate that was getting warmer for example um, humans that evolved recently in Africa may have been better suited to that than Neanderthals that were optimized for a colder European climate. Yeah because I was just thinking health specifically the reason why a lot of humans died before um, our advancement in medicine is due to their teeth for example it's commonly understood that just bad teeth and not being able to brush your teeth properly or not being able to take care of your teeth you just died of infection um so i was thinking possibly if that was to keep evolving and keep getting better into the future then maybe what did kill them out millions of years ago may not be the factor as to why they die in the future so that might you know breed the fact that more will be available yeah, and I think yeah. a really important point here is that evolution works on reproduction. So anything which is a problem after you've reproduced is essentially invisible to evolution. So, you know, many people might be listening to this in the same position to me. You know, you're middle-aged, you've had your kids. Um, you know, the things that might make your life a bit miserable, I don't know, rheum rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, Alzheimer's or these kind of things are essentially never going to be eliminated by evolution because they don't care. They do not impact on your reproductive ability. Conversely, something that has an impact on on uh, fertility or childhood survival are really strong evolutionary factors. Um, so going forwards, it will be about what are the factors that influence survival and reproduction of our children and our children's children, not about what makes your life great or miserable in old age. Specifically, we have a question about the weather. I think you might have mentioned the weather in your lecture <laughs> and someone wants evidence as to how can you tell that the weather from 40,000 years ago? It's a great question. How do we do a weather forecast for 40,000 years uh, hence? And uh, I think the, um, so the, the, the short answer is there are multiple pieces of data that feed into that. Um, so for instance, one of the really important pieces of data are ice cores um, from very old ice. So these might be Antarctic ice cores. And if you imagine drilling down into ice, what you have are layers that get older and older and older. Within those layers of ice are trapped air bubbles. Um, and so you can analyze the air in there. And why is that important? That's important because um, oxygen, like many molecules, comes in different isotopes. So you have two different weights of oxygen, for want of a better word, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Their evaporation rate is slightly different at different temperatures. Um, so uh, oxygen 18, for example, evaporates more at higher temperatures. And so the relative ratio between those two allows you to work out what the temperature of the world was when that oxygen was trapped in that particular piece of ice. And then you can use other tools to work out how old that section of ice is and kind of scale back from that. And you can do similar things using things like uh, stalactites and stalagmites to drill back through stone. Um, and for more recent data, you can you could look at things like uh, pollen. So we have really good data on uh, sort of pollen deposition, particularly at the bottom of lakes. And so you can say, you know, 5,000 years ago, oh, look, there were palm trees growing here. So it probably wasn't as cold as it is now. Um, so you can use a combination of those tools to kind of work back 
the further back in time you get, the more wobbly the data is. But uh, but certainly going back, you know, 50, 60,000 years, um, we have actually a pretty good idea of what climate was like. Where do pygmies fit in? Where do, where do pygmies fit in? Uh, very good question. So... Pygmies, um, so the term pygmies is, is not a great one for lots of reasons. Um, it's also not a very scientific one. Uh, but by pygmies, what we're referring to, I guess, are um, those groups of humans that we, we typically think of in Africa, but actually you can find pygmy groups in, in all around the world, um, where the average height of adulthood is, is significantly lower than other populations. Um, so, uh, so you have, as I say, pygmy groups in, in Africa, in South America, in Asia. Um, they have been commented on by biologists for hundreds of years since being discovered, really, if you like, um, with the question of why why are they much smaller than other people? Um, and the original sort of argument was that this was a selective benefit for some reason. So one point, for example, is that if you think about African uh, pygmy tribes in particular, they tend to live in densely vegetated parts of of tropical forest um you could imagine that being you know um six foot six was not a great advantage if you're trying to run through a densely <laughs> vegetated uh, jungle um and so maybe there was selection for small stature more recently uh, actually the latest evidence suggests that's probably not true and in fact i think the latest uh, suggestion is that this is a um sort of an indirect consequence of selection for limited nutrition uh, essentially, these are uh, people who are living in really, really tough circumstances. There is a terrific pressure, evolutionary pressure, therefore, to uh, reproduce earlier because you're not going to live very long. Um, one way you can lower the age at which you reproduce is to not grow so big, right? So if you if you only have to make it to a, you know one one meter forty or something instead of one meter eighty, um, you'll get there faster uh, with less food. So food is scarce. That's thing. So one one suggestion is that selection for limited nutrition, fast reproduction, has essentially secondarily selected for much smaller people uh, but the jury is still very much out on all of these uh, questions and I think um, it's a difficult question to answer because it, it kind of runs the risk of these kind of just so stories of saying well uh, obviously this all fits the data um, but uh, but I think it remains unclear which of these drivers was the most important in selecting for smaller stature. And it was was it just their height? No, there are other. So there, so yeah. So there, I mean, the most obvious uh, thing is is the height. Um, but there are other sort of physiological uh, changes, um, and there are changes that are secondary to that, particularly around kind of reproduction, uh, for instance, which is one of the reasons people think this may not be. We may be being misled by height as being the big thing. It's obvious. You know, the obvious answer is. They're much shorter. They must be shorter for a reason. What's a good reason for that? Maybe it's about ducking under low branches. Uh, but actually, it may not be quite as simple as that. Okay. What are your thoughts regarding the similarities in the societal construct with bonobos versus chimps and human society? Are we more chimp or more bonobo? Um, that is a that is a good question. Uh, so unfortunately, I think. I mean, if, if you watch nature documentaries, uh, you know you will know that bonobos are this wonderful sort of largely vegetarian, peaceful um, uh, species, um, and chimps, especially in more recent nature documentaries, seem to spend all their time kind of waging war and killing each other. Am I correct in saying that bonobos have sex for pleasure, and that's something that defines them differently to? Yeah, I think yes. I think so. So pleasure is probably a term to be used cautiously here, uh, but they certainly have sex for non-reproductive reasons um, in terms of social structure and these kind of things. Um, So, so yes, there's been a lot of sort of uh, discussion on that. I mean, I think if one was to boil it down at face value, there is probably more similarity between human societal structures and chimpanzee structures than bonobo ones. Um, whether that is because there's some kind of closer evolutionary ancestry there or is that just because the kind of selective pressure that has led to the particular structure of bonobo society works well in that environment and the one that we have works well in our environment um, is a bit unknown Uh, but certainly that kind of territorial aggression kind of conflict that unfortunately characterizes a lot of modern human society is seen much more in chimpanzee culture than in than in bonobo culture and if we look further afield um could ai lead to a new homo species wow um so could ai I, i mean lots of stuff i guess could in theory lead to a new um, homo species so uh, let's let's kind of play that through as a hypothetical example I, uh, so an AI uh, process that led deliberately and consistently to some kind of separation of humans into two groups um, and and therefore restricted their reproduction to those groups applied for a very long period of time might lead to speciation um, I mean it's kind of hard I guess you can think of these sort of total uh, dystopian horror story things where AI I don't know 
allocates people to their sexual partner at birth and and uh, you know that's the way the society is structured and bad luck um it would in theory drive that um is it going to happen i certainly hope not uh, but it's a it's a theoretical possibility i guess yes and unsurprisingly, um, your lecture has had a lot of views on YouTube since it's been available. So do go and watch it if you haven't watched it already. And we've taken some questions from the comments section. One of the questions uh, we had that got a lot of likes, you define a species as a group of individuals that can reproduce successfully together. I understand that enough Homo sapiens and enough Homo neanderthals interbreed that many of us carry some of their genetic material. Does that mean that the definition is incorrect or is homo neanderthals better characterized as homo sapiens neanderthals so so i guess the question here is if we know that neanderthals and um, modern homo sapiens interbred are they are they really distinct species um and, and the short answer is we don't really know uh, whether that's true or not um uh, the so to be one genuinely one species they would have to not only interbreed but interbreed um essentially with the same level of success as either group on their own so for instance if you ent- interbred but you know two out of three of your infants didn't make it to adulthood whereas only one in ten didn't make it if you were just homo sapiens breeding that is still a species barrier you're less fertile together um there is some evidence that was true for neanderthals and homo sapiens in that we don't see the even representation of all neanderthal genes in modern humans but probably not enough to be to have a definitive answer whether you call it a separate species or not for a species that is now extinct is something that taxonomists and and anthropologists argue over all the time um it's probably you know more than my life's worth to get into that uh, a particular argument um and i guess to some extent it's a bit of a semantic i mean it's humans that impose species boundaries you know species don't care about themselves they just care about what they can reproduce with um uh, so so yeah without running the clock back and saying i think i think at the moment the jury is so far out that actually either of those terms is is reasonable and i would i would argue you, sh- you could use them both as long as you understand the difference yeah why do you think we're the only species to develop intelligence what do you think the end result would be if we had competition well, I guess the first question is, are we really the only species to evolve intelligence? Intelligence is a quite a subjective term. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I think you can, you know, if you look at many of the organisms that we know use tools, for example, which now extends, it's a long list, you know, extends uh, to many bird species and dolphins and whales and similar. Um, you know, that's actually, I would argue, a reasonable level of intelligence. Um, there has been recent evidence that other species, for example, mourn their dead, um, they have some concept of mortality. Uh, all of these things are things that I think are actually quite uncomfortable for us as humans, but I'm not sure that you could argue they are uniquely human anymore. Um, it is still true that we are the most advanced, in inverted commas, species in the sense of tool use and technology use. Um, and I think it's a wonderful question to think about what would it be like if that was suddenly no longer the case? And for those who you know like watching science fiction films, you know um, this is of course the central premise of many of those. What when somebody else lands and they're smarter than you are? Um, and and that is a very interesting question. Would we kind of welcome it with open arms and say, "Great, we'll learn from you," or actually would our kind of intrinsic sort of territorialism kick in and um, it would be all out war and only one one winner at the end? Um, we'll uh, I guess maybe we'll find out one day. A comment on YouTube ties into that human level intelligence only seems to have occurred once during evolution and that there are no cases of convergent evolution when it comes to intelligence yeah has it really only occurred once that's a good question i mean we so we now know for instance uh that neanderthals had very advanced technology they made tools they buried their dead they did uh you know used fire um there are uh, so so they i think you could argue had at that period of time a very similar level of intelligence to homo sapiens of course, we have a common ancestor. So is that truly distinct? No, probably not. Um, I mean, I would say it is tricky to define whether intelligence is uh, is the same or not elsewhere. So if you think about um, many of the whales and dolphins, for example, they clearly have, by a human measure, quite a high level of intelligence. Um, but they also do a whole bunch of things that we, we can't possibly do, you know, communicating over massive distances by sort of, you know, sonar. Um, we can't do that. Does that 
mean they're more intelligent than we are in that particular domain but they just can't use a you know an iphone um I, I think it's a very human construct to think about intelligence as being all about can i use a computer and a mobile phone and do all those kind of things um there are plenty of things that other species do that require advanced brain power that we don't um so so i'm not sure it's true that it only evolved once our form of intelligence i guess has only evolved once um and if we ran the clock back and did it all over again would it evolve in the same way that's a very good question and of course in the future no guarantee i mean we've been around for a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms uh you know 25 million years from now people might wonder what on earth people were talking about with homo sapiens because this other dominant much more intelligent life form rules the world so let's yeah. find out we had a question um from youtube saying that you mentioned in the lecture that the europeans brought over smallpox deliberately to the americas is there any evidence for this uh, unfortunately there is yes uh, so initially uh, smallpox entered the new world as it was then um probably inadvertently. Uh, smallpox was rife in Europe at the time. Europeans were arriving, uh, bringing with them smallpox. Uh, and of course, there was no resistance at all in, in what is now North America. It had not, the disease had not been there previously. And, and it was, they were enormously susceptible. Native Americans were enormously susceptible. Uh, unfortunately, subsequently, um, people with sort of nefarious aims to take over the country realised this. Um, and so, for example, we have good historical records of sailors bringing, uh, deliberately bringing blankets that had been slept in by smallpox victims in Europe with them and then gifting those blankets to Native American tribes in order to spread the disease, eliminate the tribe and then take over their land. Um, it's one of the earlier examples of biological warfare and I have to say a particularly egregious one. But, uh, but yes, there is unfortunately evidence both for inadvertent and deliberate spread of smallpox by European settlers. Thank you very much for joining me today, Robin, and thank you at home for listening. By the time this episode is released, Robin will be preparing for his fourth lecture in his series. Can you tell us a bit about it? I can indeed, Richard. So the fourth one, we're going to look at uh, what feels like relatively recent evolutionary history, although recent I use kind of subjectively here. So we're going to look at the evolution of modern humans um, in the last sort of couple hundred thousand years and particularly look at some of the factors that have shaped our evolution um, so things like farming and tool use and warfare um, and what we can learn from those particularly in our genomes now we have access to uh, tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of human genomes we're starting to learn quite a lot um, and some real surprising facts actually about how um, relatively recent in human history diseases warfare migration patterns have shaped the modern human genome and, and so we'll pick into the, some of those and think a little bit about where we may be evolving in the future from there robin thank you very much for joining me thank you it was a pleasure